We've been talking about the theandric union and how the two natures of Christ relate to one another. And remember that little diagram that we drew? So this represents the person of Christ and we have the divine and the human. And you have these two natures that relate to one another in an organic way. It's, there's very much a, a permeation. There's a unity there. There's a union, a real union of the human and divine natures while the divine and human natures remain distinct and unchanged. Very, very important to accept that, affirm that. And so one analogy could be Let's see, you know, well, what we're not doing here is creating a third nature. That's going to be one of the heresies that we talk about. The natures are going to remain the same while, while in unity, while in union. So, so what, we're, what we don't want to talk about is, is, is something like a chemical reaction where you have a, a something else different that, that's, that comes about as a result of putting two chemicals together, you know, to create some other new chemical. That's not what we're talking about. It's more like a solution. So, so like here's a, a cup and you have a, a, some water in the cup, but then you put Kool-Aid or sugar or sugar and, you know, your, your Kool-Aid uh, in there and you have water and sugar, they mix together. So there, there's an altering of the, of the whole effect. Yet the properties of sugar are still there. You still have the same molecules. You know, you have H2O and you have what, C6, H12O6. You know, you have and these remain the same when you put them together. It's not like one um, molecule attaches to the other molecule and, and there's a difference in, in the, the molecule. We're talking about sugar and water remaining what they are yet permeating one another such that it influences what you drink. Okay, so in the case of of Christ, you, will, you have Christ exhibiting both characteristics of humanity and characteristics of divinity in a single person without divinity or humanity being changed whatsoever. Okay, so you, you see, see a distinctiveness in the operations, yet you also understand that he's acting as one and he is one person. So again, what's the principle? One person, two natures that are wholly distinct and unchanged. And so like what we said from the, Chalced the Chalcedonian Creed, you have one person, two natures, and these natures are unconfused, unchanged, indivisible, and inseparable. And these statements really had come out of the presence of the heresies who were making some erroneous claims, doing some things, you know, going to one extreme or another or whatever. And so I want us to talk about some of those things. Um, we'll call this section the rejected options. I believe that was Odin's term. So these are the heresies. It's a nice way to say heresies. <laughs> they were rejected. Ebionism. Would you want anybody have any idea what Ebionism is? This is a Jewish Christian cult or heresy. I mean, these, these are Jews that actually liked Jesus, but had a very different understanding of who Jesus was than, than the real Christians. Uh, they 
considered him to be the natural son of Joseph and Mary. So obviously that's a problem. So it's not really an incarnation. But that Jesus received the Spirit at the baptism. So he's not really God, right? So if you were to diagram that heresy and you had you know, the same, same basic diagram, how would you, could somebody come up here and diagram, help me diagram this, Nathan, you're close. How would we alter this diagram to, to show that this is the Ebionite heresy? What are they denying? The deity, yes. So Jesus is only a human that is spirit filled. Okay, okay, you got it. Very good, that was easy. They're, good. They're gonna get a little harder. Okay. And then there's docetism. Anybody have any idea what docetism is? This is related to Gnosticism which said that matter was evil. And so, okay, so, so someone, come on up, James, I want you to diagram this one. So this denies the human nature, the human nature of Jesus, saying that he only appeared, he was only in the appearance. Because why, if you believe that matter was evil, that flesh was evil, sinful, inherently, why would you want Jesus, this wonderful person, to be tainted by the flesh. So, you know, make him to be only in the appearance of a human, right? Okay, so, so do a whole new, uh, yep, do a whole new diagram. Uh, yeah. It's about the best circle I think I've ever done. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can see that anyway. Good. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't want to look exactly the same. No, no, no. Okay, so let's go ahead and. Okay, so Avinism and Docetism. And then Arianism. Come up, Josh. I want you to diagram. Arianism. <laughs> Anybody have any idea? He's going to draw it as we talk about it. Yeah. I thought that's what docetism, or like that it's basically the same as docetism. Is it not? No. Both deny. Not perfect to share not what they buy, but a good man. Just a good man. Yeah, the true man. The highest created being. Okay, the highest created being, yes. I think Jehovah's Witness. Okay. They're basically okay. modern Aryans. So, so, I mean, really though, Arius did have a somewhat high view of Christ. I mean, not near high enough because he's still finite and there's an infinite difference between finite and infinite. But... In fact, he argued that Jesus was, the Son was of like substance, not the same substance with the Father, but of like substance. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't homo usias, it was like homo usias, or homo usias. It was, there was a little iota in there mm -hmm. that he added, which made a huge difference, right? So. You go from homo usias, you stick a little iota in there, that's like substance rather than same substance. Mm -hmm. Jesus in Arius's mind was a very high being, very close to God, you know. <clears throat> but he wasn't God. He refused to to affirm the deity, the full deity of Jesus. And so he becomes a man and all that, but mm -hmm. he does not come 
become a man as God himself. Mm -hmm. So this is obviously a very serious heresy. Right. So how would we diagram that? So obviously his deity is rejected. Deity is rejected. So, so he's the first and highest created being. Mm -hmm. Below the transcendental line. But he is below, right. So if you, if you talk about this creator-creature distinction, you know, he's still below that line, right. mm -hmm. which is huge, you know. She'd be like right there. <laughs> yeah, so denial of the deity. Now, now, you know, he wouldn't, Arius wouldn't have said that he was simply a human, but it is a denial of the divinity. Mm -hmm. yeah, so the very, way. very serious error. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's Arianism. Now we've got... Nestorianism. Now this is going to be a little bit more difficult to diagram. And uh, Jason, you're next in line. So let's, let's talk about this. <laughs> this is a denial of the unity of the, of the, whoops, I'm sorry. Let me start, let me start, let me fix that first. Yeah, we're going to edit this part out. Yeah. Um, it's, it's I, I could either say person, unity of the person, or unity of the natures. Right. But one person. It's one person, two natures. You yeah, don't say yeah, unity yeah, of the persons. persons. Yeah. <laughs> so let me, say, let me say natures. So we're going to cut that part out. Let me... Uh, Get this right for the tape. Okay. And then there's Nestorianism, which denied the unity of the two natures. So you have a human nature and a divine nature, but there's only a moral union, not an organic union. So why would, why would Nestorius have said, no, there's not a complete, full, organic union between the human and the divine. Why would he go down that road? Why would he make these statements and contradict what others were saying? Anybody have any idea what his concern was? In some ways it was a valid concern. Was, it, was he concerned that the deity of Jesus would be lowered through association? Through close association with humanity? Well, his, his concern was that he didn't, he didn't feel like the deity itself should be involved in the actual sufferings of Christ. So if there's an organic, real union, then you would have God suffering. How, how could we tolerate that idea? How could that be, be biblical? You know, what, I mean, in his mind, you know, God's suffering. You've heard of the patripassionism, the idea of the father suffering. Well, you know, if I can understand how you, you could say, no, the Father doesn't suffer in the person of Christ. But what about the Son? Surely the Son suffers by virtue of his union with the human nature. Mm -hmm. And what's wrong with that? I mean, isn't that the point? Yeah. That he comes in, enters into the human race to identify with us, suffer with us, pay the price for our sins as the God-man. And so, you know, I'm not going to say an historian couldn't be saved or they're so heretical that there's no way that they, you know, if they understood things quite that way, you know, that, that there's no way that they could ever be saved. You know, there's, there's a misunderstanding here, though, that is, is problematic. Uh, but it is a, I guess, a forgivable misunderstanding, as maybe a few of these others are. I don't know. But do you see the problem? This is a heresy 
because we really do believe that God has identified fully with us and entered into our pain and took took our pain, took our you know took it to the cross. Um, so, all right. So, Jason, come up here and see if you can diagram this. Figure out a way to diagram this. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's that's the idea. Now you may have some some dotted lines here or whatever, you know. But there's no real organic union between the father and the I mean I mean the uh, humanity and the deity. Okay? So very good. Now, what about Eutychianism? Anybody have any idea what that is? Eutychius, another heretic. What he was doing was combining the human and the divine natures in a way that created a third nature. So the human nature is swallowed up by the divine. So you have, you don't. So he's really neither fully human nor fully divine. Now, obviously, that's a problem. So, so this is it's mixed. So you're going to come up and try to draw that. See if you can catch. Okay, very good. So you have the deity and humanity in here. Somehow, you know, maybe you could put a little slash in there or something. Now, that doesn't completely represent it because really you, you've ended up with the third nature. But what you're showing here is that there's confusion. Mm -hmm. There's no real distinction like this suggests. Mm -hmm. A full humanity, full deity. So there's... It's just kind of all mixed up. More of a, a chemical reaction kind of thing. You produce a, a new molecule, if you want to use a physical analogy. Okay, and then Apollinarianism. Any guesses on this? This denied the human spirit or the mind. The, the, the divine logos took the place of the human spirit or the human mind. There's some aspect. So let's say we divide the humanity up into body, soul, spirit, or heart, mind, or, or whatever however you want to do it, some aspect of this is replaced by the Logos such that you actually have something less than human here. So yes, fully divine, but instead of him having a human mind, he has a just simply the divine mind, the mind of the Logos. Or something very similar to that. Something like that. Now, you know, I, th I think he would have allowed for some immaterial aspects of humanity to be to be present, but there's something that that he's saying here that makes him less than fully human. So we can't do that, you know. So don't let the the mystery of it, the complexity of this, send you off toward a heresy. 
It's like, you know, you could ask the question, well, how could the divine mind and the human mind relate to one another? How could he have both? Well, I don't know. I don't know how he could have both in one person. But you just affirm it. Fully human, fully divine. And we'll talk more about that, how that could happen. But... Just protect yourself from these heresies by affirming, not saying anything that contradicts these basic affirmations of the church. And then monothelitism. Okay. Um, I have a little survey I ask at this point in the class. I want to see how many of you believe that Jesus has one will, and how many of you believe that Jesus has two wills? As in mind, will, emotions, will. The capacity to choose. The faculty of choosing. Okay, how many say one will? Raise your hand. How many say two wills? Okay. Five to one. I usually get more of a split. And that works for a little better debate. But <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll, I guess I'll tell you up front that the heretical one is the one who said that there was only one will. <laughs> Murder at the stake. Murder at the stake. <laughs> That's what this means here. Mano is one. And this, this here, this, this word here, is the root for, uh, for will. So only one will in Christ is what that is. Now, now we can debate that. Um, I, re I remember discussing this with Bruce Ware. He teaches at Southern Seminary. I've referred to him before. We talked about this issue, and he says, you know, technically, I'm a heretic, <laughs> according to, because I don't only think that there's one will in Christ. And I tried to argue, argue with him a little bit about it, but um, I wouldn't be quite so cavalier about saying you're a heretic. <laughs> you, know? So you, you know, you push against what the consensus of the church was. Now, now this came a little later. This, this heresy or the refutation of it comes a little bit later. It, it's, not, it's not addressed in the, the Chalcedonian Creed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there, there's... It, it depends on how you, how you define things. It depends on whether you look at will as an attribute of person or an attribute of nature. And, and you could be confused by that because, you know, one way that you could answer that is, well, of course it's, it's an attribute of person. Only persons have a will. Yet, are you going to say that about mind as well? Is mind an attribute of person or nature? But didn't Christ have a human mind? And if he had a human mind, he also had a divine mind. And he had, you know, so I, I don't, I think that's almost a fruitless discussion. It's speculative, really. Yeah. Not having had two natures ourselves to understand how they relate to one another. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so how how would you have a human will and a divine will in the same person? Or is there any evidence that Jesus had both a divine will and a human will? Well, he was praying, had 
Okay, so not my will. Now he's talking about his desire, what he wants, what what he would purpose, what what he would decide to do as a as a human, right? Which seems to be rooted in a faculty of choosing that he had as a human. Now the problem with the use of the word will is is that it's it's easy to equivocate because the word is used in different ways. So I could say that you and I all have the same will in regards to passing this class. Every one of us have the same will, the same purpose. You know, I want you all to pass. <laughs> you all want to pass. You know, we have the same will. But is it will in the sense of a faculty of choosing? Whatever it is that God has gifted you with that it enables you to make a rational decision one way or another. No, we, all, we have distinct wills. So, so the question is, does Jesus have two wills in the same person? And related to that is, does Father, Son, and Holy Spirit each have a distinctive will or do they all share the same faculty of choosing? Now again, if you talk about will as in purpose, intent, they're all going to have the same will. But if you're talking about the capacity to relate, to choose, to decide, you know, if, if Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are choosing to communicate with one another, it seems to me that there has to be some distinction of wills. Now, maybe, maybe you could rephrase that in such a way that, that, you know, shows a better unity of that, but um, th there is, you know, at least one will that is, that has maybe three different modes of subsistence or something. There, there's, there's something going on there that enables Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to have an actual love relationship with one another. Right? Now, in the case of Jesus, you know, if he has a distinct will as the Son or a will that he shares with each member of the Trinity, does not he also have a will as oops a will that he has as a human being a distinct will that makes him have you know human mind you know that is part of his humanity as as fully human right Mind, will, emotions, everything that is to be human, he has. So why wouldn't will be part of that? So back in the garden, he's able to say, not my will, but thy will be done, because he has a decision maker <laughs> that would prefer to do something else because he's human and he has different desires and yet he submits his will to that of the Father. Nevertheless, he says, not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will. Now, how could his intent be any different than the Father's in relation to his deity? I don't see how it could. But his desire and, you know, his, what he would do if he had his way as a human, could be something different. And that seems to point to a capacity to choose that he has as a human and not just as a divine being. Remember, we're talking about a mystery here. But one of the, th one of the things, this is a statement that comes out of the Third Council of Constantinople. Each nature wills and works what is proper to it in communion with the other. 
So we're talking about the two natures of Christ. Each nature wills and works what is proper to it in communion with each other. So the human nature functions as human. The divine nature functions as divine, yet they work together. And really what you have is the human will consistently always following along the divine will. His human will is never acting any differently than what his divine, his divine will would intend to do. Yet freely. So if he, if he is truly a human, then he freely chooses as a human. Yet he's always freely choosing what his divine will is doing. Now, just is that making him two persons? You know, it, 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 it starts to feel that way, doesn't it? Yeah. But yet, if, if you fail to make a distinction, you know, you could probably say that everything that he does actually feels like one action, one choice, because he's doing this as a single person. Yet, when you dig down deep you realize that we're not talking about two persons here, but we're talking about two natures working in concert, in communion, mutual permeation, mutual indwelling. And so, you know, I think we just need to keep emphasizing one person, two natures, not Nestorianism. We're not going to go there. A real union. He's, he's, Functionally one, yet, op well, there are two operations, yet there's, there's in a way, one action. Technically, maybe two, but, but you only see one action because it's a single person. It's, 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 it's a mystery. Yeah. But how could you say it any differently without going into heresy one direction or the other. Not my will, but thy will be done. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You know, he's, the, the son is begging the father to take the cup. Please don't let me have to go through this. Because he doesn't really want to, as a human. Where does that come from? Well, you know, at least comes from human desires. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then he says, not my will, not what I want, mm -hmm. not what I would choose if I had my way, but I want what you want, Father. Surely that comes out of his humanity. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know anyone whose experiences or who has experienced conflict slash confluence of dual natures. So, I don't have anything to compare it to. Right. Right. I, we probably always try to work from what we know, and in this case, we can't. Right. Do you think that if you. So like Nestorianism, if you deny the unity of the natures, um, say that they're two persons, couldn't that start a pretty direct path to being able to say, I deny the Trinity? How's that? Well, just because if you're denying that Jesus could be one person, two natures, then why couldn't you say, God can't be one person, three natures? Okay. I mean, maybe not. I just it just popped in my head that if like if yeah. you're going to argue that Jesus couldn't be, mm -hmm. then that could start a direction towards. I mean, mm -hmm. why couldn't someone say, okay, well, why if you don't believe that, mm -hmm. well, why don't you believe that? Yeah. Well, in either case, we're not talking about an actual contradiction. Mm -hmm. 
No, it's possible for God to be one in nature and three in person. Exactly. It's possible for the Son, for Jesus to be two in nature and a single person. We just don't know how either one of those things really work. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, we're talking about God here. Right, exactly. And he hasn't chosen to explain everything to us. Mm-hmm. But there are certain things that we know. I mean, we know that, that Jesus, as a human, developed from a little baby, mm-hmm. from even a little zygote, mm-hmm. and he developed, he grew in wisdom and knowledge and stature with God and man. Mm-hmm. So there's normal human development there. Mm-hmm. Yet, at the same time, he's fully God. Right. So I mean, we know these things, mm-hmm. and we know that he's a single person, and so we just, if we want to try to explain it to someone else, we just have to affirm what we know and then any statement that we make in our attempt to clarify or explain, we just need to make sure we're not contradicting what we had previously said. That's why I think maybe it is important that we affirm the fact that Jesus is one person yes. and two natures. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, well, we'll stop there, and talk about the, the t, the t, the t.